our honored, fun, beautiful guests. Um, so April 26th, right here, it's a Thursday night. We're going to have, we're not going to have, me and Robin are not going to have, but there is going to be the writers of The New Girl, the show The New Girl, uh, Thursday 26th, Thursday night. Okay. Mike, next week, Robin and I have Mike Mills. He wrote, be, he wrote and directed Beginners. He's pretty amazing. Right here. Um, ne next week after that, Florian Henkel von Donnersmark, who wrote and directed Lives of Others. Don't want to miss that. Um, so April 25th is the Winnie and Robin Intimate Evening for the people that, that, that bought, bought the entire bought the series. series. And aren't you guys lucky? Yeah. Um, so now we're going to... It's going to be intimate, and you can ask us anything. You can ask us, it's, and ask us anything within reason kind of an evening. Now we're going to bring on our honored guests. Um, you know, what is there to say? You know, it's one thing to be entertained and to get involved. It's quite another thing, I think, to be watching a show, screaming, laughing, wincing, wondering if you can keep watching it, <laughs> <laughs> then going... I have to keep watching it because there's never been anything on television even remotely this amazing. These are the two people who created the comeback. Please welcome Michael Patrick King and Lisa Kudrow. Uh, interesting for Winnie and I because we know both these people very well. So we're going to ask you a lot of questions. Well, where are you from now? Um, uh, Lisa and I uh, often spend Wednesday nights watching reality TV, so it's actually unusual for us to be out and about. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's just dive in, and we're going to make sure you guys get to ask a lot of questions. Yeah, you'll I know. have plenty of time to ask yes. questions, in due, in, all in due time. Um, but... I know I, well, I have several questions, but what I... First, let's say we're so thrilled to be here. <laughs> let's say that Lisa and I are so thrilled to be here. And may every show you do that gets canceled get an <laughs> applause like we just got when you walk in. Well... Really thrilled to be asked. Right? Well, there is something to be said for doing the show that you totally wanted to do and getting canceled. I mean, I know a little bit about that. And it's not really the worst thing in the world, is it? It's not pretty, four it's, years later. Yeah. At, at, yeah, at the time it hurts. It's like if someone steps on your foot, it really hurts. But late, four years later, it doesn't hurt. And no, it didn't. Actually, it didn't hurt me till about a year and a half later. <laughs> when because I'm you. not uh, I'm not as processed as other people. But <laughs> when we didn't get picked up, I actually said, no, no, it doesn't. Matter. Who cares? It doesn't matter. We did such a great show, and you can't do better than that, and so well, now what? You can't, we, we didn't do anything wrong. It's fun. <laughs> Absolute, their mistake, not ours, until then I realized how, like, business works. <laughs> <laughs> but then when did it hit you emotionally? Like, I, when I could see it in my friends who were executives or network presidents or people like that, and their automatic response was, so it got canceled because of, you know, trying to justify why it got canceled. Then talented people, writers, actors, you know, they would say, so they made a mistake. But it's the business people who were trying to justify what could not have possibly have been a mistake. What, the ratings? No, it really wasn't the ratings. So it was just too brutal? Well... I don't know. There, we had we were building an audience. It was interesting because and I mean, there's so much to say about it, but it got in a funny way less and less brutal because you got so emotionally involved. I don't remember being that emotionally involved sometimes. I mean, and yet, you know, she's you know, in the beginning, we were talking about this at dinner. It would seem that she was the most. Un I mean, it's a cliche, but the most unlikable character possible. I mean, that you, that you, Lisa, chose, that you chose to write her and you chose to be, play, the most unlikable character in the world, in a funny way. Mm -hmm. yeah. the... That's what it looked like at first. No, I right, mean, that's right. We 
the the trick with it getting less brutal, I believe, is that by episode whatever, you started to find Valerie as funny as we did. And by that, I mean you realized that she wasn't going to die. <laughs> and once you realized that she was going to keep going, which is the whole reason we thought she was funny from the beginning, because we know nothing would kill her. But at first, everybody was terrified she would die. And that Pauly G would destroy not only her, but everybody watching the show right. at home. Right. They were ter But we always thought she was funny, so for us it was a... Sh a, quite a surprise that people were so run over by the first couple of episodes. Like, they couldn't handle it. Because we thought... brutal, the first couple. I watched it recently, and they were definitely brutal, the I first think couple it, of episodes. I think it has something to do with how real... I mean, real... The word real is going to get a workout tonight. Right. And obviously, there's a lot of ways that the show was playing with what's real and was being real. But there was something about how you completely, both of you, went for how, who she really was and sort of the, the emptiness there, I would have to say. Yeah, she was chasing a spotlight. Right, right, literally. Just a huge cautionary tale. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Oh, there's just so many things to say about that. I mean, okay. <laughs> Do you think on some level that was the inspiration? Yeah. I mean, okay. well, 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 yeah. I mean, the inspiration was really we were talking about reality TV, which was not brand spanking new, but certainly not. There were no housewives yet. No, no. It was the reality TV sure. where people were eating beetles. Yes. Or and Anna, like, Nicole Smith and Anna Nicole or Smith or the Osbournes. It was it was that. Uh, it was new. It was the it was the Coliseum aspect, the right. beginning of it. And like, that's what? and they and all you know, I had seen the second season of, of Amazing Race and I saw this couple fighting and the husband screaming at his woman while she's doing the challenge eating like the spiciest something that's making her vomit because that's part of the game. And she's crying and vomiting with a camera on her that's gonna broadcast it. And I thought this has never happened before, and it's wrong. It's really wrong, and, and everyone is just, like, signing up to get humiliated. And now we're saying that it's okay to humiliate people. And so we were kind of interested in, and we thought because this is an actress and her husband has money, she doesn't need to do this to pay the rent or anything, but she'll take the humiliation and, you know, even sign up for a show called The Comeback. Right. Meaning she went away. Right. Well, it's, it's the last thing an actress wants to advertise. It's right. literally the last thing. I mean, it was. I thought it was brilliant to choose that she was married to a successful guy and had a great house and a great ring and all that. And, because a, and a, the the only difference between what you guys saw on in the pilot and what we wrote in theory, in our pitch. Right. Our rules of Valerie was that she had a, the only difference, the only thing we changed is that she had a dead end sex life. We decided to give her a hot sex life because it was too brutal. <laughs> <laughs> that, and we really wanted Mark to think she was hot and be into that. her. Yeah, totally. And that was our big give to everybody in the world. <laughs> like, she does have some guy who thinks she's hot and they have this faux sex life. So you came to that because you felt like we've stripped her of everything. Early. And we very, very early on. My, very, very and we've early. stripped the audience of everything in a sense because they're seeing... It was the only thing we we actually changed in the DNA of who Valerie's relationship to the world was, was that... And we got Damien Young, who is plays Mark, who is was so good that we felt energy there, so we decided let's make that like her thinking she's a naughty, sexy kitten <laughs> was so much more funny totally. and to us. And, and, and it was Lisa. Right. So it right. wasn't a it wasn't a it wasn't a stretch that she was sexy and cute and uh, the people would want to have sex with her. So <laughs> she can't hear that, but it's true. Um, so that was fun because that was our little like her playing like the Hugh Hefner character in her own head. And Valerie, like, now I'm in a naughty negligee on camera. But it's also super right. smart because you're right. The audience needed that. We needed that. Ah. We, we needed something. And the other thing was we wanted to make sure that you understood that Valerie had love and was choosing to walk in front of a train instead. 
That was really important. Well, I think it was that, a choice. Right. To I think hurt that herself. that's when the series um, for me, because I just watched the whole series again over three days, and to watch to watch one after the other, those first three are really intense, like really intense. Like came into my dreams that night and made me un- uncomfortable. But um, the Palm Springs episode where she just starts choosing the husband, I think that also not only do you find her funny, but she gets she makes these more and more choices that you're like so relieved. Finally, she's picking, you know, she's picking human beings over this, you know, the the lust for fame. But one of the things that I wanted to ask was that this show, given where you were at in in your life, Lisa, just coming off Friends. The, to me, this seems like the type of thing that you would talk about only to your best friend when you'd had a couple drinks. Like, I'm so scared it's over for me. I'm getting older. What if I'm the old one on a show like Friends? You know what I mean? And yet, you you just go right into it. You go into the buzzsaw a, as an actress. Can you talk about just what what draws you to, you know what I'm saying? What draws you to play a character like that? Well, I just wasn't paying attention. I'm an idiot. I mean, I I wasn't paying attention to any of that. I mean, all I could really see was that there's this fantastic boy, this like multi-layered cake of issues and topics that we get to just explore. And that's really all I cared about. I mean, I really wasn't thinking. We had an agent who said, this is really brave. And I was like, what's brave? What's brave? What am I? Uh-oh, that's bad. <laughs> like, what am I, I being? Uh-oh, what? I didn't but know see, brave. See, the, the, under the weird thing, too, is it's only funny because she wasn't Aunt Sassy. But Hollywood made her be Aunt Sassy because she was 39. <laughs> like, you're unfuckable. Right. Be the aunt in a running suit. Right. Because we're 22-year-old guys writing this, so we don't want to fuck you. So now you're the clown. Right. And that... They saw that world and thought it was brave, but it was ho- certainly hilarious that Lisa was being uh, seen as that, given osteoporosis of the <laughs> mind by the industry. Not, you know, she's also Lisa likes really dark um, cross examinations of uh, she likes to throw cream pies. She likes she likes ego analyzed and destroyed. She likes to zero in on things that are uh, false and go after them. And our job with Valerie, and because it was Lisa, it was really quite easy for me, was to, and the thing that was so upsetting to people, was that Valerie had a real heart and soul underneath all that. So they were feeling conflicted by this thing this character who was a, a joke and still human. Absolutely. And wanted something. Well, the look on the, the just in the pilot without saying anything, just the looks on, she, devastated looks on her face. And then that, which also was very cringy how resilient she was. It was like that alone made you just go, oh, no, don't be so well, resilient. Well, the oh, no moment in the pilot is when she asked for another take. Uh. And Lisa was like, yeah, Lisa was like salivating. She was like, yeah, that don't you, you don't go there. Totally. Wait and a it, second. But wait a second. OK, because are you saying because I know you've worked and however many of you have worked on a sitcom or on a show with actors, you've never seen anything like that. Oh, I've totally seen that. Yes. I mean, I mean it's not like we invented something no. absurdly cruel or behavior that's, you know, I've outrageously never seen it. humiliating. I don't think I've ever seen it depicted. I've never I, seen I, I it. Ser- I seriously right. have okay. never seen it depicted. When we did the episode where they said, oh, here comes the hate show, and they made her go like that, I said, I'm writing a documentary. That was the closest thing I've ever written to what I know is the truth of what I knew about television, those but, guys but, and her. But right, then you right. add the level of Valerie like eating that cake and practicing that horrible line over and over. It's like the part you don't think about. It's like one thing to make somebody say the shitty line, but that somebody actually has to go practice it. And, and oh, yeah, it was just brutal. That's where you started but, to but, see, I realized but that I mean, she that had is, a soul because yeah, she yeah. wanted so much to be good. 
a person who wants that much to be good, well, of course, it's partly ambition, but partly ridiculous ambition, but absurd ambition. Well, she's just misguided. I mean, she just, you know, her, her sights are just off. She's going to work really hard right. at mediocrity. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Right. right. So. I, I, I think it's. I think everybody who does their job wants to do it well. And, you know, everybody, that's what I say, everybody works so hard on shows that no one cares about and shows that people do care about. So, you know, Valerie had a, you know, I don't need to see that joke. <laughs> but that's, and is that any different than jo Juliana Margulies having a monologue in front of the <laughs> jury? It's just, that's what she's been given. So right. she's going to make it work. And when, sh and when, um, when you were, were you, did you say that the agent, I mean, the agent said, this is brave, but had the agent sort of put you together like a blind date? Or how, how did that exactly, because I'm thinking to myself, on some level, you're freed to go to a very dark place, to a very real place, because you have her, yeah. because you have somebody who can do all of it. She can do the satire, she can get completely real and naked. So you're you're sort of freed as a writer. Uh, absolutely. But, but was that your idea? She was also the writer too. Right. Right. So that's the, the the great thing I'd like to say at the Writers Guild is that Lisa is a brilliant writer. Thank you. And it's true. I mean, it's not like a vanity production like she had a <laughs> deal and she got a writer and then we we allowed her to participate. Lisa and I were in there writing that pilot line by line by line by line by line by line. And you know, Robin, from the Groundlings, Lisa is a writer. She thinks like a writer. And then I don't know how she's able to let it all go and become an actor, too. And then argue with the writer. <laughs> Only once. <laughs> okay. Only once well, over the vomit. What, what the that? vomit. What vomit? The the double the cupcake throwing up. Oh, the the vomit! Oh my God! That is the only the time game. Lisa ever argued with me. Really? Yeah, because she kept, and I think it was her actress survival. No, Every time we both easy. knew when we wrote it, it was the the classic reality show vomit, <laughs> right into the camera, and when we filmed it. David Steinberg was directing, <laughs> and he was just sitting there very, very, you know, patrician-like. And every time she would go to vomit, here's the camera. She would go, Ugh. and, like, turn her face off and vomit off to the side. And I would go, no. And he would say, what do you mean? She vomited. I said, she didn't, I didn't see the vomit. This is all about seeing the humiliation of the vomit when it's replayed. So he would go up to her and say, Lisa, okay. Ugh. <laughs> and, and I would say... No. And he would go, I'm out. So finally Lisa was yelling in a cupcake with a cherry on it. Oh, you're not coming in here again. Oh, you're not really. You're fucking kidding me. You're coming in here again. I did. No, I said, you sadistic fuck. Something like that. And finally I, I said, I'm mind. here on behalf of Lisa Kudrow, the writer. And she doesn't see the vomit either. And Lisa said, Fine. And she threw up once you. right into the thing. The only fight you had was when you were in the cupcake suit. This is brilliant. Yeah, that's it. It's beyond brilliant. Life nope. imitates art. Because yeah. I really was feeling like, yeah, yeah, that's what would happen, but this is a show. <laughs> the only moment where I was like, no, but it's a show. No one wants to see anyone right. vomit. We're not really going to show that. Michael, that you're funny. And Dinty Moore is back in her mouth like, no. <laughs> Wow, that is Paid such off. an image. It yeah, like hardwired instinct. It's like, don't do that to an audience. You don't show them that. Only it's moment. funny that I, it was, yeah. I, I'll tell you, what lot. made me cringe as literally as much as that was Valerie dancing to I Will Survive. <laughs> I mean, seriously? Because I, I work with Lisa, but I also know her pretty well. And she's, you know, she's a fairly, you know, calm person. And to see that. Yeah, oh, I know. It was just <laughs> that, that's, unbelievable. And, and then the scene in the Viper Club where she finally lets go with Juna Song. And we, the, the great, here's the great victory of that. Because Valerie was completely always watching herself. Yeah. She never, and that was the hard thing about writing it. It's the only show I know of where the main character never leaves camera. So you could never do a scene about her. Right. Like, oh, here she comes. Everything had to happen directly in front of her. And it would drive us crazy because how do you move a story 
when the person in front of the camera knows everything that's going on and how do you there's no secrets from her right and that was the the original title of the show was raw footage because we just wanted it all to be raw but almost like unedited a mess and so Lisa never left the camera. So the one minute in the series where she let go of control was when she got swept up in the moment and actually let go. She let go of the camera. When she comes back, her husband's dancing with another woman. <laughs> Just like she let go for a minute. And, right. and her husband's right. dancing. She let, let That's the ball go. That's the episode go. where Juna has a band and yeah. they're performing at the Viper Club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That, so, so just take us back for a second for instance, when you say something like that of what a big challenge that is, and I'm thinking, yeah, that's a nightmare that the main character is always present and not never being spoken of or nothing happens that she doesn't witness, basically. When you were first putting this show together, were you thinking, were you thinking, were you ahead there? Or did that hit you like a ton of bricks while you're in the middle of writing it? Like, oh, shit, this is we, kind of... We just knew that the show was Valerie never gets off the camera. And we didn't even think about how we were going to move the stories forward until we were in them. We just knew she couldn't leave the camera. And so the fringe of every scene became sort of a secret to the audience. Like there's one scene at the upfront where she's walking by the bathroom and Polly G and Tom come out and see her and go back. <laughs> and she doesn't even know that. So that was our little like, oh, something happened she didn't know, but right. the audience does. So we started looking at the fringe of what we could do. So you started to sort of collect those moments mm -hmm. as you could play them realistically. Mm -hmm. Like, so a lot of it has to do with where the camera is, right? Yeah. Like, literally. Yeah. That was probably your obsession at that point, right? Yeah. I mean, where is the camera going to be? So I understand what the... Oh, no, the... I mean, Clark... Um, Mathis. Thank you, yeah. Um was I mean really like the third character? He was the camera. The, camera. <laughs> the DP. Oh, sad. What's happened to Lisa? <laughs> she, she can't remember camera. She's retired. But the camera operator as well as the DP, and he—that's why we wanted him. I'd worked with him before on something where he, you know, was such a genius with the handheld. Right. And he has such a great sense of what the story and what's happening and what's coming up and new. He was really, he was like, really good at when to... And that was the third one, right? So there'd be like a really good take of Lisa and the camera didn't do what it was supposed to do. Like it didn't go in fast. And so then we'd have to do it again and Lisa was flawless. And the other thing I want to say is every single moment, every single syllable was written. See, that was our another another big question that we both had because we, we know, of course, your, your history as a groundling and your improv whole... That's your whole background. Right. That started you as an actor. So, and but was it written improvisationally? Because I know a lot of times, in order for it to sound that real and not be improvised at some point in the process. Valerie was written by Lisa, and we, then we would all take swings at it as well. But when Lisa would come up, even on like once we were in production, I was a, I was so desperate to get the cadence exactly and when it was grammatically incorrect i wanted it exactly as when she was improvising valerie so she would come up and we would at one point we, we tried to get a, a court stenographer <laughs> because we thought it was the only one who could go fast enough and it was so expensive wait because you you're saying you would be with each other and you would just be doing well, we valerie doing together, i could sort of do it and then when we started like when we were in production lisa would come up on her lunch hour Right. And we'd have an area, and we would take a swing at it, and, we'd, and Lisa would literally sit there eating, and then she would do Valerie for us, and we would just try to grab every wrong, like, <laughs> like I would literally write E-H, 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 and then Lisa would use it as, a, I guess, a cellular memory thing of remembering exactly how she had said it. But when she was doing that, Michael, so had you had you beat it out? Stories. All, you had beat it out a story, and she was just like doing, well, this is what Valerie would do in that moment. We would say, like, uh, Polly G says this. We'd have areas, but then Lisa would. What's your response? So it, w so it was an Im improvisation, but a in I mean, the an writing excellent room. improviser. It you are? <laughs> That's in rude. the writing room, Lisa would improvise. Then there were many moments. Every moment of Valerie was not improvised by Lisa. Right. But. but it was a great template. Because when you would hear her, the voice, so to speak, uh, I mean, when you would hear that coming out of her, that would be what you were aiming for Yes, and in the, your mind. And that's so funny because when HBO read the pilot, 
they were like, uh, it's not funny at all. Right. And I kept saying, I it imagine. will be when Lisa says it. And they were like, <laughs> what? I said, when she says this, it will be funny because she goes to a place. How did that go over? <laughs> well, they, they literally, at that point, I, we were using all our power. I mean, I was using right. all my, my Sex and the City power and the, the power of the friends, which I think eventually blew up in our face in the press because you said everybody was expecting the friends, and here comes Lisa. And it's like, where's Phoebe? Here comes Valerie, and she's in pain. And people are like, oh, put, put her in Manolo's. Where's Phoebe in Manolo's? That's what we want. <laughs> well, I think that's, I mean, you know, your agents have called it brave. And I can understand why that would have given you pause. Uh, but it certainly was brave. I mean, there is a f incredible fearlessness to it, to every part of it. I mean, even that moment, there's so many moments I think of, like that moment you were laughing. I was watching the commentary today. And um, that moment where you said in the commentary, suddenly we're into scenes of a marriage, where they're in the bathroom and he's just taking a shit, which is like the, you know, like the earthiest moment yeah. <laughs> and then he comes out and she's looking in the mirror and she doesn't realize the camera's on and that little face of like am I a little too old you know that little worried mm -hmm. and his sweetness toward her but it wasn't too sweet it was just kind of sleepy oh my god that killed me just the just taking the time to do that in the middle of well he just taking a shit I mean, that was... Well, and she was doing good. her extremely fake video diary, like, and I'm scared, you know. <laughs> she was doing, like, this soap opera performance, and we wanted him to be shitting all over it. It's a comment. <laughs> it was her fault. So, like, to me, that was like a sledgehammer <laughs> metaphor, you know. Lisa, was this character existing? Was this something that you a character you wanted to do something with before you hooked up with Michael, or...? Yeah. Yeah. I mean... She wasn't that fleshed out, but I mean, when I was in the Growlings, I did a monologue called Your Favorite Actress on a Talk Show. I believe I saw that. Yeah. I was really struck with how phony and what accent is that? I thought you were from Van Nuys, <laughs> you know, and talking about their favorite cause, which was more about them having a cause. Yes, you may applaud, you know. So um, that's what I was interested in, and I thought, well, that to start looking at reality shows and people chasing the spotlight and getting humiliated, we won't feel as bad for a person who is that actress, you right. know. So that's, and really, when Michael and I had lunch, we weren't sure why. We knew each other anyway. I mean, we had known each other. You did. You did know each other. We did, yeah. And the agent said, why don't you guys have lunch? And we're like, well, we like each other. Yeah. That'll be a fun lunch. I mean, I'm not going to do a show. I just finished 10 years of one, and Michael had just finished Sex in the City, which was not like light part-time. And, <laughs> and I remember him saying... Thank you for noticing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I hear that wasn't completely improvised. I hear that you wrote some of that. Yeah. Go ahead. But he, and he's like, I mean, you don't want to do a show, do you? And I was like, no, do you? And he said, no. <laughs> And I said, I mean, look, I do have an idea if I were to do a show, the only show I would do, <laughs> honestly. But, I mean, and I honestly meant if I were going to, the only thing I'm interested in, and I just started talking and did the actress, and he just went, wait a minute. And that lunch, we stayed there for two or three more hours and ended up with the show. That's fascinating detail. Ooh, I did love you, that. when you went into the season, did you know where the season was going to wind up? And then in terms of um, the individual episodes, did you sort of come up with... Her the, journey. With the journey going into it? Did you have everything? Yes, the, we knew it everything? all. Wow. That, I think that was also a big disappointment because you know, we, we got eh, reviews. And then in the middle of the season, everybody started going like, oh, wait a minute, like turning it around. But they had no faith that anybody had a road that there was actually going to be a journey or a path or we had like an idea. It didn't mean that it was going to not go into a wall, but we actually had at the end of the first episode, she's going to get everything she wants. Right. Even though she knows better, getting it will then give her amnesia and she'll right. just go right back. It's like getting a hit of heroin. Or yeah. So we knew the journeys, but 
I got lost when we were filming the Palm Springs episode because I started to look at the shows. I was editing too, and I remember I had a, like a, a I had a moment of a, a loss of understanding of what we were doing, and we were in Palm Springs, and I had seen the second episode where Valerie's just waiting for her car forever <laughs> with the valet. Right. Third. Third That's the third episode because right. we knew the fr- upfronts. The third episode was just that sort of. Get to know the cast, and then Valerie's car doesn't come, and the camera's on her. And I came out to Lisa, and I said, I don't know. I, I don't know if there's enough. And she had her, she had a towel on her head because she was going. She said, it's exactly what we wanted to do. It is exactly what we were trying to do. It, we, it's the, this is just what we were supposed to be doing. And we were now filming episode six, and this was three. She said, this is what we wanted to do. This is what the show was. Don't worry. Don't lose heart. Do you think? Wait, it, can I just say one yes. funny thing though? While I'm so sure, and I'm and and I wasn't wrong, okay. And I was like, no, no, look, this is exactly what we're supposed to be doing, and I'm right, and I know that I'm right, and no, I don't think I need to touch the back of Mark's hair at the end of this episode. Couldn't be more wrong. It's oh. like everyone's favorite moment. And I was like, that I don't know. I don't think we need that. So mm. just to say, and that Michael was like, episode. no, no, she has to touch his hair just touch his hair and it's like i don't know why i mean i don't all right i mean fine it's fine fine, fine i'll do it big, big, i i mean that's really the show in so many ways that they gave us this document to look at that was um i guess you would call this your first outline mm-hmm. um which we were, we're going to make available, it's available in, the, in the library if you guys want to check it out it's so detailed you guys it's filled with it's as if you had already shot it and you're describing everything you see when you, I mean, it's so, then we see this, then we see, I mean, it's so detailed. It was like an this is when we first glimpse the crew. This is, I mean, everything in the show is here. That is our tool. You know, like outlines are your tool to let you discover it as it's coming out of you. And it was such a new idea what we were trying to do for us that we had to really figure out how is this going to look and what is it exactly so we went through all of this for ourselves i'm sure we handed it to hbo and they were like what the who has time for a 12 20 page single space back and front anyone read it madness and look we bolded areas (laughs) because you know they're not listening now so we bolded this and also what it wound up being is the first two episodes because I overwrite. Now there's something miss there's something that isn't in here that I'm very interested in because I was watching the commentary like I said and in the commentary the whole little thread with the water Oh that's when, another Lisa moment. Yeah, you said it, that was inspired by Lisa. Lisa. Lisa is like we we did the pilot and we're we're writing the pilot and Lisa comes in one day and she goes, "I there's a water thing." And I said, "What? Well, there's a there's a Water in the wall. She doesn't want to deal with it. Am I that grumpy? I don't think I was. I don't think I was. If you add beauty and grace on top of grumpy, that's you. Um, you were like, I, I don't know. That's not grumpy. That's like dismissive of your own idea. Yeah. It's like, well, this is probably bad, but there's water. It's and like, she it's has like to, something like this. Something but... like water and the wall and Mark is like the house. And she was like. I don't know why, but she's stepping over something. And that, of course... Not the, paying attention to, to the things that are supposed to matter. Yeah, like your house. Right. So it, it became this en- enormous parable of her neglecting her home for the spotlight. And then it's that, gutted. That final moment when she receives her pickup in front of that ruined wall, I mean, and the, that Leno. is... <laughs> what? Milano, Milano. <laughs> but also, I mean, I, I, I can't picture the moment without. But I mean, I'm just curious. Did you then spitball together and go, okay, so if there's if there's something in the house that's leaking or there's water in the walls, uh, wait a second, wait a second, we can use this or I mean, were you? Well, we we figured out what would be the damage, and and the whole idea is the damage of just put some towels down. It was the parable of what she wasn't looking at and how it can turn to bigger damage in her home life. That was what we were trying to do. And it's just a realistically 
believable thing, like a real person has a hole in their wall. It's so real. And then she comes home, and it was more damaged than she thought because she ignored it. But and it'll hit you where the... it really hurts because you're not oh. even going to notice the wall, but it's that Deleno. Like those, your... Her dream was deconstructed. All your, your pride and joy. Gone, on it, the floor. It sounds like when Lisa showed up doing that, it wasn't, it, I would guess it wasn't dismissing your ideas so much as that thing that I think happens to all writers, where you have this instinct about something and you can't instinct. articulate why, and she could probably never explain why it was the water. She didn't think through. No. No, it was like she had some instinct that Cheers. you needed something, and then, you know, that's one of the things that always amazes me about writing in general, and Winnie and I talk about this all the time, is these completely irrational things mm -hmm. that you get early on that you can't let go of, but you don't really know why. And then later you're just like, oh, that p other part of me is such a fucking genius to know that, and I didn't really know why I knew that. You're so at the last page, you're like, oh, what oh, do we do without the water? Oh, yeah. How and, would we oh, end and this? And now it all fits. Yeah. But, but what I get upset about, and this is just maybe me, but I doubt it, um, is if somebody like an executive or even a producer or whatever, a non-writer, or even a director, will say, why is this here? Too early to me? What will happen to me is I can't defend it because I literally am that sort of, oh, I just should be water. And I don't <laughs> understand yet what it's even doing in my script. I'll understand that in a few weeks. Right. And it's like I have to be. There's, there's no end to this story. There I'm just is, complaining. But, but there is there there, <laughs> there 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 is something that needs to be said to that, which is God love. Even though they canceled it, there was never a note wow. from that's HBO. Right. No, that's nothing. right. Nothing. Right. So you have your nothing. You have. They your just like it was like heart. you know I I used to say HBO. The old HBO was like um, independent study. <laughs> Everybody else is going to high school, and you're an independent study. And you have to do your work on your own, and if you don't, you flunk. But no one's checking your homework every day. And there was never, they might not have even gotten it, and they might not have even liked it. But they were like, no one questioned the water, awesome. ever. No one questioned anything. Well, that's, that is a thing of beauty. It is, and that's why it worked yeah. to the point where we got to realize our vision. But I think Not their vision, but our vision. <laughs> But they, but you know, also like Michael said, they didn't understand the outline or the script, and said, "I don't know, do it," at every turn, because they're all so cool. I don't know, do it. But when we had our auditions, because Michael kept saying, "Wait until you hear Lisa do it," mm -hmm. and then when we had our auditions, and I was reading with people, you know, right. for the network, and then they completely got it. And I think they were excited until they realized, oh, God, but what is it? Like, how do we market right. this? Right. <laughs> right. And that, to me, was just, you know, like you were saying, until the sixth episode and you see that and, you know, it takes time. I figured when we were working on even the pilot and then thinking about what that first season would look like, all I could think was, no, no, no one's going to get it until the second season anyway. Right. And that's when, and that's why we're where we are, because right. you can't do this on a network, only right. because the network won't give you two seasons. So, Lisa and Michael, what would the second season have been, since you talk about that, and everyone wants to know? Mm. We, know something. we know. I mean, Lisa would have gotten power. I mean, Valerie would have gotten power, Ooh. which would have been probably her worst thing. That could have happened to her. We we knew that Nick, Mick, Mickey was going to get porcelain veneers, <laughs> very very bad porcelain veneers, and leave his lover for a 24 year old Brazilian. Like he was not going to go well with success. <laughs> that was Mickey. And I thought we were we were, we had talked about prom, uh, that Valerie would promote Gigi to showrunner. Polly would get dethrone right. Polly, and that Gigi would get as big as this room, and become a monster. T like the showrunner as monster doesn't matter who it is. Right, right. And right. and that Valerie would be chasing an even bigger it's like success, if, which is right. horrible because then she actually now sees she's successful, so now she wants. She has to keep it, and she and, has to. And the thing we always knew, I mean, at one point Lisa even said Valerie goes to New York, and you know, and literally anything could have happened to Valerie. You mean Valerie. like cheats on her husband in New York? No, or? Oh, no, we, no. Mark was going to cheat on her. 
Yeah, they she, were going to be in trouble because he, by the end, is so attention. sure that she's done with this. Thank God, because of course it's a nightmare. And then when he sees her just like soaking up and loving the success of her hit show, doesn't matter. And we see that he's really shocked and he doesn't know what to do with it. And so. And then she fights for her. She actually fights for her marriage. To the point of the scene we knew she was going to chase a woman down at a, a charity benefit at a, for, mus- for muscular dystrophy and can't, and trying to get through people in wheelchairs to say, miss, miss. I mean, we knew that it was going to be like she's really going to have to fight. And at one point we talked about her going into therapy with cameras and thought, is that too big? And it happened on every reality show the next year. I think every single one of those therapists should have their license revoked. Oh, sure. Any therapist and Dr. Drew should be first in line. Really? Oh, yeah. I love Dr. Drew. I love Dr. Drew. (laughs) Dr. Drew is always like, don't leave. It's important for you to have reality cameras on you. Please oh, well, don't. Please don't. You're editorializing, please but all right. Don't hurt I am. I'm, I'm on a different subject now. But um, we had lots of ideas for <laughs> Valerie's plight. I'll talk to you about this later. And also her trying. To, the big, the big episode. The big thing in her would be her begging Mark to stay with her. Would have been the second. Season. And she, would she have turned into a monster with the power? Uh, no. So. Because she's not Nicole Kidman. That was what we said. Oh, right. It doesn't no, doesn't matter doesn't how successful she is. No, no, not that not Nicole successful. Kidman's a sex. Oh. Valerie can never was, be Nicole Kidman, so she'll never be a monster right. in that she'll never get enough. So she'll always be right, a... Right, right. No matter what success she gets, no, she's still I, I don't not know Nicole invited. Kidman. I was, yeah. I, I was talking no, about... No, no. My she, won't, she won't be a monster because she'll never achieve her goal. Right, at the Finish time, it, yeah. that's what we were saying. Like No matter how much success she achieves, she's still never going to be invited to a party where Nicole Kidman is. And so even if she is, to get in there and she's not going to get what she wants out of that party. Right. Even if she is at a Golden right. Glow party, right. she's n- it's not going to be enough. Oh, that would have been so fun. Yeah. <laughs> Just to watch everyone ignore her at a Golden Globes party and have well, her you know, you know, I, I, I actually, friendly and I love actually, your work. Love it. <laughs> and they don't know who she is or... <laughs> anyway, good on you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Now, I have to ask this because, is it okay if I ask this? Because I don't know what you're going to ask. <laughs> so, so yes, it is okay. Oh. oh sure. Well, because every time she does Valerie, people are are going nuts. So, they, Michael brought a I scene. brought a scene that we never filmed, that, that Lisa, that oh Lisa. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> I brought a scene that we never filmed between uh, Valerie and Juna. Yeah. Where uh, where Valerie is telling Juna how to get a laugh, that and I just showed it to Lisa and I said, would you read a little of it? And would you? Yeah, a all little right. of all it. Right, it's right. too long. Michael and Michael's gonna play Juna. Michael's gonna play Juna. I'm gonna play Maul and Ackerman. Yeah, well, I mean we ended up taking off. the uh, the notion of this scene and putting it at the restaurant, right? Because uh, that's well, what we every, needed. Yeah, I mean this but was. This, this is not this scene, but what, what I think is interesting about this is how serious we were about Valerie's craft. <laughs> like this scene Right, right. About Valerie knowing her craft. Oh, my God. I'm sorry, but that oh, the whole thing where she's practicing the fall, I mean, oh, she yeah. really, really cares. And then she gets Jimmy, and he tells her what to do, and she goes, no. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I'll do it my way. Forward. No, Forward. thanks, Jimmy. No, I think back. Well, yeah, back, backwards, better. Yeah. Well, she has a pole in her back, too, which is her whole problem. Um, She had a pole in her back, which is why she couldn't do what Jimmy says. All right, so this says the studio craft service uh, area. Day, Juna is standing at the craft service table picking at junk food. Valerie comes over and sidles up to her. Valerie is holding a room and board script. So I'll be Juna. Sorry. Uh, Okay, this onion dip is so 7-Eleven, I'm all over it. Guess I found your laugh. Hmm? A, a, a laugh you're missing here, right here. Valerie points to her script with a lead pencil. Page three. When you come home depressed, here, in, in between the two lines, there's a laugh right here. I'm sorry, Val, but what? <laughs> I don't know what you mean. Your line, you know, who's home? Anybody? I need some love it. <laughs> you know, you're doing it. You're doing it like you're asking who's home. And that's. But I am asking who's home. <laughs> well, yes and no. <laughs> You know, it's a comedy. 
So, see, if you run both lines together, like you don't care who's home, you just, you know, need some loving, you know. <laughs> Juna laughs, charmed. Valerie smiles. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's a laugh. Well, let's try it. Okay. She does. Who's home? Anybody? I need some loving. Okay. Good. But still... <laughs> You know, too much of the asking who's home. <laughs> you know, say it, say it like you're saying it to nobody. Don't, don't even wait for an answer. <laughs> who's home? Anybody? I need some loving. Um, and you're saying, you're saying loving. <laughs> with a G. And they wrote loving with no G. It's funnier. <laughs> Pay attention to the writer's words. They point the way, you know. <laughs> loving, not funny. Loving, funny. <laughs> That's it. No, literally. I used to do uh, an exercise of myself. What situation could I put Valerie in and what would it be? How would it be funny? And one day I actually said, okay, Valerie at Auschwitz. <laughs> now, which line? Which line am I in? Which line? <laughs> Valerie, to me, could go anywhere and be anything. We actually talked about her going to New York to study acting. I mean, she could but do after anything. After studio and she would sit for like how she remembers that picture of Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> And that would be her at the actor's studio. <laughs> I know I know you guys talk on and off about maybe doing a comeback movie. Is there any possibility of that? I don't know. You don't know? Well, you know an awful lot about what's These people what's would all be there, happen. right? <laughs> <laughs> um, should we take a couple questions? Questions? Um, yeah, the, my, wait for the microphone. I'm sorry, Victoria, I never warn you. Oh, while we're doing this and I'm looking at Victoria's thing, I just have to comment on the fact that you guys, the way you dressed Valerie, I mean, you didn't cross over and make her in a joke. You really didn't. I would wear a lot of those clothes. I didn't think I have a lot of those clothes. I, my... I, I, I took some. Yeah. And I just so thought... we wanted Valerie to look good at all times. She was pretty and yeah. funny and the joke you, was never that. But you that. didn't cross over. You just didn't cross over and make her a gargoyle. No. No. Cool. Um... Oh, yes, right that gentleman. I think one of the most um, hold on, wait for the it's mic. For I'm the mic. sorry. Yeah. One of the most heartbreaking moments in all of television <laughs> was when we learned that Valerie has a spike in her back and cries on camera and wasn't part of the high school team photo. I want to cry right thinking about it right now. <laughs> Where did that moment come from? Did you always know she had a spike in her back? Like, how did you get that real? Mm. That's a great question. One of our writers uh, had a rod in her back, and uh, we were looking for a, a secret that would somehow very thinly uh, justify an outsider thought for like why you become an outsider in life. And uh, we both, lo everybody in the room, loved this writer, and uh, we thought about that, and we thought it was good because it's invisible and nobody knows, and yet it also has pain in it, but it also could be something that you could reveal in episode 11 and not go, well, how come I didn't know that she had that all along? And we wanted uh, a, a secret. And also then we thought the fun way to reveal it was the metal detector. And, <laughs> and, and, and we wanted to get her to the point where it was beyond show business because Valerie would never punch... Polly over show business, mm -hmm. but something deeply, mm -hmm. deeply uh, unhealed. That there would is something deep in every well, in every person, but especially every like sitcom actor. Anyway, I think there is something like really, really deep. We actually like went back like rolodexing in our minds. Like, has she ever done anything that would make it impossible that she would have been? A, it's me. I'm very stiff. <laughs> of course, I could have a rod. <laughs> Well, and, then, I, and, and I will and point out that you also had scoliosis as Michelle. Yeah, yes, just yes, like, people thought. just look at you yeah. and go, scoliosis, <laughs> I guess. Um, and, and then the trick was for us was we were worried about crossing over into too much pathos. And so we pulled back by having the but camera off. thought that way for her to, that she would never, cause, because she's so manipulative and such a, in a bad actor way, we, this time it needed to be 
catching her by complete surprise and being really uncomfortable with it, having to I still remember, leave the room. I it. still remember, Lisa, when she improvised that in the writing room. And I remember because the, 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 tr the thing that you said is tragic is she thinks she's spinning it, and it catches her. She thinks, well, I busted, so now I have to go on camera and say what this is. And then when Lisa did it the first time, I was like, Bruh. the emotional oh, yeah. thing. The, the, the surprise that it gets her is the thing that kills me about it. Mm -hmm. And probably you too, that she can't stop it and wasn't expecting it. Right. That's because Lisa. that's the only way that character could have a could real true emotional moment is that it, it yeah, it, that she, it ambushed her. Yeah. Right. She thought she was in control, which was the whole series. Valerie thought she was in control. Even when it was going bad, she was convinced she was spinning it up. Yeah, but she was never in control for one second. No. I mean, once you sign on to do that reality show, this was another weird just sidebar. I'm de developing Romeo and Michelle as a musical, and we have a new director. And the director contacts me and says, I think that we could have people wanting to do a reality show about this. And my first reaction is, no. Because I know, aside from everything else, I'm going to be that, like, bitch monster that I would love to watch. Um <laughs> But I'm sitting here and I get this email and this is yesterday while I'm watching the comeback and I sent an email going, no, absolutely not, no way. But why not a documentary series? <laughs> yeah. Wait, what's the Yeah, difference? documentary series. What's Honestly, the just the idea, just the idea of having to like look good for creative meetings and wear makeup and. But you I, always look good. Well. I, th I, I, don't know. I don't know what I to say to that, okay. but no, I, I wouldn't do it. How about it. one day I'll talk to you, not here. Okay. <laughs> everybody. That'll, we'll put that on our list of <laughs> Dr. Drew. Idea. There's Dr. Drew. There's that. Um, okay, let's take let's another take question really quick. Uh, yes, you, who I know, named Jordan, or do you know? We're going to really try and get everybody now. Um, I mean, as much as we can. Who's Polly G based on? <laughs> Name names. It's a, no, it's a composite. Of who? <laughs> I never I worked All with I will tell you like is that. the size was accurate. <laughs> that was the prototype physical size of uh, the, 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 the whipped together showrunners that I knew. But wait, I have to add. So then when we have a staff in the room, every one of them knew who Polly G was. And for each of them, it was a different person entirely. Of course. That that makes sense. That makes total sense. Same thing for Valerie Cherish, by the way. Yeah. Everyone is so certain they know exactly <laughs> the person that I had in mind, and it's a different person there for are everybody. Three actresses we knew that did this. Um, microphone, sorry. Three actresses did they? We called them the yoga blessing hands. <laughs> the bullshit yoga blessing hands, like. And it was always like a way of giving you a compliment after you say to them, you did really well in that scene. <laughs> but it was back at you in a weird way. Well, I, I, I couldn't help but think when I, when, when, when I hear her saying, I, need to, I just need to be heard, that, oh. <laughs> um, that it's a person who's never listened to anyone in her entire life. <laughs> I, just need to, I just need to know I'm being heard. Oh, just just so, say it. Even if so you're not, just get me out of here. That's right. It's that, and it's also, all right, you're being heard. Now go do what I told you to do. <laughs> well, okay then. You know, As long as I'm being... No, no, it's no. one of those therapy things right. you know, it's, that it's someone picked up. On. She picked up, it's exactly. Therapy. Something she picked yeah. up. I think we should take one more question, but then what we're going to do is this. Take a break. To, to have a break, don't you think? I was going to say we go like till a quarter of. Oh, sorry. Okay. Till a quarter of. So let's take a few more questions. <laughs> yeah. I, I, oh, yeah. well, I'm, I was just going to say, too, the other moment that was like the listen thing was <laughs> when the seat filler won't get out of her seat. And she's like, some people will do anything to be on camera. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, oh, my God. So who's uh, our, who's yes, back there. Uh, this one's more for Michael, but it's for everybody else as well. Um, I was curious. I see that you were on Murphy Brown, and you kind of got your writing start there on television. And I was just wanted to know what kind of things led to getting that, and then also just in general, what kind of advice you have for writers that are trying to get to the next level as far as 
working in television, et cetera? Yeah, my, my, my advice is that you only have your own path. I was 38 in New York, and I still didn't have my rent. And I thought, uh-oh, <laughs> I ran out of time <laughs> for Hollywood. And I came out with a, a job. A show fell apart instantly. I was a playwright in New York and, and a comic. And then I, you know, there's a lot of kismet in this. Somehow I wrote a script on this show that failed about golf. And uh, can you imagine? <laughs> it, was, it was a show about a, an obsessed golf character on this show, Good Sports. Have you ever played golf ever? No, but it was a female character who was manic. And that is the script that got sent to the writers of Murphy Brown. And the guy who read it was a golf freak. So it like wake woke his interest up and then I went in and did that and then after that you know I mean there's like a series of all I can tell you is just keep making your own journey and make your writing as good as you can because you only get the read you don't get and the big other big lesson is you don't get marked on a curve you get marked exactly what's on that paper so it's not like they're going to go oh I bet he wrote this in a weekend <laughs> it's that's what you are what you hand them when someone says, let me see what you wrote. And, you know, of course, that's all varying degrees of your level. But at each level that you're at, try to be as good as you can on the page. Because the one thing I've seen is that scripts actually do move writers up. It's not connections as much as scripts. And once you get in a room with writers and you're good, the writers move you along. And it works the opposite way as well. If you're not good, the writers will not move you on. But so it's about the writing and this, once you get in a room, it's about how you are in the room. And then the writers themselves, don't you think, Robin, the writers in sitcoms, especially the writers in sitcoms, you're gold if you're good and you just keep moving. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I know also, um, I don't know if you know this, but like even working on a shitty show, other writers will move you along. I was on one of the worst shows of all times, one of the many shows that I was on that was one of the worst shows of all times, the show called The Mommies, and Cindy Shupak was on the show, and uh, Darren Starr had an idea for a different show, and I recommended Cindy, and she wound up on Sex and the City. Yeah. And um, But I, I do feel like when you're staffing a show um, – you that person does what Michael's saying. You get one shot, and the vast majority of scripts that we get are mediocre. You know, they're people who have gotten agents. A few of them are terrible, and very few are really good. And the most of them are mediocre. So I think the best thing you can do is spend all your time getting better, and just writing, 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 seeing if you can meet other writers that'll help you. And you can polish somebody else's style to death. That won't get you anywhere. Find your voice, because that's what I hire. Mm. It's not a joke structure. It's not anything. It's like, oh my God, that's a voice I've never heard. That's a thought. I've. That's life, or that's a unique joke. It's your point of view. It's not perfect joke writing as much as an original joke. The other thing is, it's yeah. like you're looking for good writing, but you're also trapped in a room with people for months and months and months and months. So you're looking like, who's gonna be fun and interesting to have around whose mind is going to turn me on and give me ideas and um, so the script is almost like your calling card to get you in the door and obviously you have to deliver after that but that's why the best thing I, I don't really know that many showrunners now who even like reading spec scripts anymore I think people like reading or, do you read spec scripts or yeah but not yeah I, for I other do. shows well you know multi -cam uh, yeah yeah but I'll tell you my first Murphy Brown meeting I was on and the only, the only word that came back is, uh, they want to know if you can listen. <laughs> so I went in for another meeting and listened. And both those skills are very important. That's Being a really on good point. and listening. Michael, what was it like after doing the comeback, which is just like really the beautiful skewering of being on a sitcom and now doing another sitcom after that? Did, I mean... Yeah, um... Uh, being in charge of a sitcom is different than being on a sitcom. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So there's no, I don't feel I'm in prison. I, I feel like I'm the plantation owner and the slave <laughs> of my own, of my own situation. So it's different than like room and board was uh, a prison. Yeah. To be on room and board would be a prison for me. 
right. you know, to be under a, a jailer like Pauly G. That would be a prison to me. Right. So I've created this other prison, which I'm sure it's a white collar prison right. with really good beverages or something. Right. Uh, I like it. I actually think the comeback was a unique thing, and I'm so proud of that we did it, and it's like a hybrid of everything I knew. And I, I'm interested in being back in the, I call it the joke gym. I feel like I'm in a boxing gym now again. It's a very interesting, after going from the movies, which were two and a half hours long, and I was telling the studio, I can't get them any littler. <laughs> That's it. I cannot cut a scene to now be like, 21 minutes, you're out. All right. I mean, literally, to go from telling uh, the new line, no, it's two and a half. Well, it's to almost, now 21 minutes. I feel like, yeah. yeah I feel like, it's almost know. like you're at your fighting weight. Yeah, it's like, it's like back to that. Back to that. It's back to something that... But also to grab other parts of stuff, too, so that it's not just a sitcom, but it also has some of the heart or stuff from one camera. Or, oh, yeah. Right. No, I totally see that, but I was just, you know... No, no. I, yeah. I actually am enjoying it now that we just stopped. <laughs> now that you're on hiatus. No. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, wait for the microphone, please. Enjoying it retroactively. Yeah. Um, I, this is for Lisa. Um, I, yeah. I, haven't, I hadn't seen the show, but I came because I'm a fan of both of yours, and I was blown away by this, what I saw. Um, <clears throat> what I was struck by is I've seen, there's a tradition of this kind of work, which is skewering what you know and skewering everybody or, you know, in the in that vicinity. But what I felt was that there was a humanity in your approach that, to me, I mean, it was very interesting about your, you know, this thing about the spike in your back and everything, but I felt that right off the top. And, you know, like the accident. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there's so many things in there where you go, oh, my God, you know, I'm not that person, but I could have been that person. And I think that you really were able to capture that so that people, you know, identified with you, even though, and I don't think you're the most unlikable person. <laughs> I mean, I, I can appreciate that. But how did you find that in your, in your readings and in your writing? I mean, you know, right. both of you. Because the, the focus for us wasn't um, skewering TV. That wasn't the main focus. The main focus was um, humiliation and fear and what everyone's response to that is. And the thing about the networks was just that they're in a state of panic that has something to do with reality shows, you know, and then it forces them to make certain decisions that can't possibly work, don't seem to make sense. They're not evil, you know, and then Polly G, what, you know, I think we were scratching at and maybe could have done a little more with was how this was a talented writer and he and his writing partner wrote what they thought was a good pilot. But the women were too old and the network made them make them younger because friends, you know. And then to hedge their bets, the, the network forced a reality show and they had no say, no power, no control over any of that. A reality show which is taking jobs away from writers also. You know, it was... So the focus wasn't really, look how stupid everybody is. It was more like, look what happens when you're in a state of panic. She's in a state of panic over, i, I got to get back into the spotlight, otherwise <clears throat> I'll disappear or it's something, you know. Also, uh, we love her. We loved her because, you know, she's born of Lisa. And we loved her. And we loved her everything, her vulnerability and her ego and her desperation. Anybody can relate to wanting to be seen. Mm -hmm. Her so. egolessness about her ego. That's impossible to, to like satisfy. <laughs> what was interesting, too, was, again, as the show went on, there it, it was all so complicated. And I'm kind of just back to talking about the character because that what you guys are saying about the whole show, it's just fascinating. But she's so dismissive of her husband in the Golden Globes thing. It's like, no, I don't, you know, no, I've already asked someone. But then he's like, she's fat. 
and no one likes her. And no it's one likes her. It's not just yeah. that she's fat. She's fat and no one likes her. So I'm at first I'm going, oh, she's being so mean to her husband. And then I'm like, oh, my God. You know, she she really has a feel for this person. And that's, I, I don't know, it just really got me. I don't have a question. But also I she, I, I, I hate <laughs> to go one level deeper than that. Shh, no. Robin, she invited Gigi because the cameras were on her. And then she what justified throwing her husband, throwing, that's how, it's like that's the how like thin slice we went. Right. She probably wouldn't have invited Gigi if the cameras weren't on her. And then when Mark said he wanted to go, she would have rather gone with her hot husband. And then she went to a humanitarian spin. We were very aware of her spin. Because I, to me, I got puppy. that she it's only like asked. She, she like to me, puppy. I got that she only asked Gigi because the uh, Gigi because the cameras were on her. But then I thought the humanitarian thing was real. But it's what you're complicated is, because yeah. she was touched by Gigi crying. <laughs> she says, "Don't cry. Don't. We'll we'll think of something." Yeah, and she yes. has, she's out she there. She almost panics when there's a real emotion in the yes, room. That was the point. Yeah, yeah. She sort of panics and is and, and must must stop emotion. <laughs> what must make it go away? Type of thing. Right, exactly. Right. Especially with you know on my show. <laughs> when it's not you. <laughs> Can't have unhappy people. <laughs> it's got to stay upbeat. That was the other thing is when she's doing I Will Survive. I mean, that killed me. But she won't even sing the first part. She's like, oh, let's just go to the part where I survive. <laughs> no, first, I was afraid. No, <laughs> no, that part there, is not going to work two, for There me. actually are two moments of improvised Lisa. <laughs> One is when she's singing... Um, I will survive. And she said, her voice goes, and it's the very last moment in the scene. And she goes, uh, she says, be more angry. And then she goes, oh, angry hurts my throat. And that yeah, camera oh, goes that out. That was amazing. Anger yeah, hurts I my throat. Down, and yeah. then the other moment was in, in the very, in the last episode when they get picked up for another season. And Laura Silverman, who plays Jane, hugs her. That was unscripted. And Lisa looks in the camera and says, look at that. She cracked wide open. I could almost cry. Because she never knew what that girl thought of her. She yeah. she just never. That was such an, a mysterious and Laura ter oh, terrifying. Yeah. Everybody we cast, everybody we cast, aside from the actors, was so important that they didn't look like actors. From Mickey, who looked like somebody you would discover on a reality star, to. <laughs> TV to Laura Silverman, who has the energy of a non, a like a techie, yeah, to, yeah. to Damien, the husband. Everybody was just not theatrical so right. that she could be theatrical. It was perfect. But I was, I, I was noticing one thing that stood out um, for me, one of the many things that stood out for me in the commentary was that you said that you hadn't made up your mind really what Laura, what, um, what Jane's attitude toward toward her was, and that, and it was so fascinating to me because you said you knew where the series was going, but you didn't know where that relationship was going, and maybe that was part of the energy because it was such a confusing, fascinating relationship. It was so, so complicated. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, it was scary, and then that night when you went to her house, oh my God, oh my God, that was really scary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm sorry if <laughs> I'm sorry once again I have no question. I'm just overwhelmed by the show. Um We're done. We're done. Well, we're gonna take is it okay, Robin? Yes. Okay. Whatever you say now. I feel like I've been strict enough for one night. I feel no, like we Winnie. take a break because there's refreshments oh. and we'll come back. And we'll take ten. We'll take ten. A minutes. hard ten, guys. And uh, yeah, a hard ten. Thanks everybody.
fun. You weren't in it very quickly. Perception of what they're showing to be. Just like with features, you don't have to say it's you know, Batman meets, you know, whatever. And they go, that's great. And you just made it up because you want them to read the script. Sons of Anarchy, Breaking Bad, they go a couple seasons on one network, and then they move. So I was thinking, was there any possibility of you moving, like the first season going to AMC or going to whatever? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, then it's born. Studios on some like HBO and Showtime where they, they get good people and they kind of they just let them run with their ideas. Yeah. Compared to the corporate model, oh, for sure. 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 No. I was just done. Yeah, I write some girls. Is she allowed to acknowledge you? Probably not. He was like, probably. Not this bad. Right, right. Sure, sure. Good, good.
Oh, yeah. And it was just, and then you guys came in. 